Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long program where we invite guest hosts to interview authors. This week, Philip Howard, attorney and author of The Death of Common Sense, talks about his book, Life Without Lawyers, Liberating Americans from Too Much Law. Howard uses the stories of real people to explain why he believes the U.S. legal system needs to be reformed. He discusses his book with Joan Biskupic, Supreme Court reporter for USA Today. Philip Howard, welcome. We'll be Thanks, talking. Joan. We'll be talking today about your book, Life Without Lawyers: Liberating Americans from Too Much Law. It's filled with lots of anecdotes, as well as lots of strong, provocative arguments that uh, some of our viewers will agree with, and some of our viewers will find uh, take exception to. And I thought what we'd try to do over the next hour is cover some of the colorful anecdotes you've come up with, but also get you to uh, explain some of these arguments and how you uh, how you develop them. This clearly is a topic you've been thinking about for a long time and thinking about some of the absurdity of life with uh, slides that injure kids and playgrounds now having no fun. Why now? Why now did you decide to take a look? Well, it's, it just took me 15 years to finally figure it out. <laughs> so it's, so it's, I'm, I'm slow. I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I've been thinking about the relationship of legal structures to how people behave in their daily life. Structures affect how people behave. If you build a highway, then people will move out to the suburbs. And if you uh, have laws that work a certain way, you will affect the way the, the, the people behave. And, uh, and I think that American law has evolved in ways that it did not intend to evolve. And it's dramatically changed the American culture. The title, Life Without Lawyers, how did you decide on that? And do you really mean it? <laughs> well, it depends on which part of it. Uh, we did have a hard time coming up with the title because you could come up with something boring like, uh, the boundaries of freedom or something you know, it'd be sort of abstract which is also what the book is about um, but it's what the book is about is not about getting rid of all the lawyers it's about allowing a teacher to run a classroom without worrying about lawyers today teachers doctors really anybody who deals with the public have a little lawyer on their shoulder whispering in their ear all the time you might get in trouble might you break a rule that sort of thing and so this is about creating a, a recreating or restoring a free society where people can focus on their goals and, and try to accomplish things rather than simply uh, be in a compliance mode where they're trying to avoid getting in trouble. So life with fewer lawyers or life with lawyers over in a pen somewhere and not so much in our daily lives as much. Yeah, it's, it's lawyers. I mean, lawyers are important. I'm a lawyer. I'm a, I'm yeah. a, I haven't been fired yet. Uh, I... Um, Lawyers are important. There, there are lots of real disputes. Lawyers need to handle them. There need to be lawyers and legislate, you know, and running governments and such. Uh, but I don't really see why we need law in our daily lives for, okay. for, for most people. You mentioned the, the teacher situation of uh, many of our classroom teachers worried about what proper conduct they have. And that reminds me of a couple of anecdotes you have in there, one involving the little five-year-old girl where the principal didn't want to touch her, so she's hauled off in handcuffs. Right. And another one that's very familiar to people here in Washington of the administrative law judge who sued his dry cleaners for something like $54 million <laughs> when they lost his pants. Right, right. Uh, how did you find all these anecdotes? Did you, uh, did you put out the word? Did you check uh, news sources? How did, how, it's, it's filled with so many of these that I wonder how you, um, how you compiled them. Uh, well, actually, um Compared to my two prior books, there are, there are fewer, fewer anecdotes. There are many more voices in this book. I'm really interested in how people feel, how a teacher feels or a doctor feels. But the anecdotes simply are there to reveal a, um, a point uh, where people are not doing what they think is right. In the case of the, the child being handcuffed, here's a five-year-old girl who obviously has emotional problems, and she starts tearing up the classroom in St. In, in, in Petersburg, Florida. It's actually videotaped because... For some reason, the classroom had a, like a security monitor, so it's videotaped. And she's destroying the classroom, but no one will touch her because and the, um, and this is the rule in, this is the rule in most schools. And you don't touch, you're not allowed to touch someone except to prevent harm to someone else, not to prevent harm to the classroom, <laughs> uh, you know, throwing all the papers on the floor or whatever, because people, the teachers are afraid they're going to get sued for an inappropriate touching. That's the genesis of the rule. So you have this, I think it was an assistant principal 
shadowing this little five-year-old girl like she's in a linebacker drill going back and forth like that on this video till they finally they steer her after she's destroyed the classroom steer her into the principal's office also videoed <laughs> and and it con she continues tearing up the the principal's office until the police arrive in handcuff her and she screams and the video stops well that's just absurd I mean, everyone knows what the right thing to do is, is to restrain the, the girl and take her someplace where she, until she cal calms down. It's so simple. Before we move on to a couple of the other absurd examples and sort of your overall right. theme about uh, how society can start remedying some of these absurdities, right. you mentioned the video in the, uh, the classroom and you mentioned the rules generally right. that teachers can't touch. What were the genesis of those rules? What was it, what was it that got society to that point in your mind? That, that kindergarten classrooms have to be monitored in that way? You know, I'm not sure. I've never uh, done the um, archaeology of, uh, of when it was that we became hypersensitive about an adult touching a child. I mean, there have been, as we know, the Catholic priest scandals and such. So there are adults who have a problem in how they deal, de deal with children, but that's not most adults. Um, uh, but at some point, there were there started to be lawsuits, and I think it actually came. Uh, it's thought to be more of a problem in underprivileged areas, and so the teacher training in in Detroit or in East Harlem, for example, is ever never uh, touch a child. My uh, my daughter's roommate from college was teaching up in East Harlem, and she was uh, um, uh, teaching swimming at, on the on the side. And she was asked, she had to ask each time she held the child up in the water, not once at the beginning, but each time, may I put my hand on your stomach? And, right. the, and the kids are saying, well, why do you keep asking me this? But that's what she had been instructed to do. Right, because of some past incident, but, presumably. Well, or, or just probably not because of a past incident, probably because of a past lawsuit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where some parent says, you touched my child, you didn't get approval to touch my child, and therefore we're bringing a claim, and it, it's not that people will win the claim, but if you're accused of something that, that resembles sexual harassment or inappropriate, your, your characters, you, you can never get your reputation back. Um, so why would you take that, why would, you, why would anyone take that risk? Right, for the school board to institute yeah. that policy. Now you have some solutions here in a broad way, um, and let's stop on the school situation for a second, and then we'll move into the right. dry cleaners. And then I wanted to probe a, a wonderful personal anecdote that you have in here. But in terms of our classrooms, uh, explain what you think the, the first step should be to sort of re letting teachers reclaim right. maybe the boundaries of their classrooms. Right, teachers have to take back control of the classroom. If you go to any successful school, public, private, charter, it doesn't matter, the teacher, th there's a culture, the school has a culture, and it's a culture of of uh, where, the, where the students generally respect authority, misbehavior isn't tolerated, you get removed from the class if you're disrupting the class, because then the other 29 kids can't learn. Um, at a minimum, the teacher doesn't fill out forms all day long. There's some bureaucracy, but you do it before or after class. If you go to a public, most public schools in America, it's nothing but bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. If you want to uh, dismiss a child that's disrupting the classroom, it's basically impossible. You have to fill out forms. Uh, the principal has no um, resources to to put the to take care of the student somewhere else, uh, so sends them back into the classroom. Uh, the the, the uh, student knows that all he has to do is threaten to force the teacher to go to a hearing, and it went automatically because nobody has time to go to the required due process hearing. So over time, and Professor Richard Aram at NYU has uh, has studied this. He did a book called Judging School Discipline. The, um, all the, the, quote, due process and, and, the, and, and the bureaucracy surrounding discipline has eviscerated the authority of teachers. And, and they can't maintain control. And uh, from your point of view and the research you've done, it hasn't been because it's been a true threat to students' individual rights or their, their abilities or, you know, infringement on any students who are disabled or have problems. It's more the threat of lawsuits that has caused this. It, it's all the threat. It's, it's never the, it's the, uh, it's the prospect of being dragged into a hearing. Uh, 